Hi, in this tutorial, I will demonstrate how to do inverse modeling with physics informed neural networks in PyTorch. So I will follow one of the codes provided in our paper here, which I'll provide a link to, where we uh, use sparse data measurements to find wild shear stress without imposing the inlet boundary condition in a steady state uh, blood flow problem. So the data, the codes are available in this uh, GitHub directory which I'll point to. And um, I will go over one of the codes here, which is the 2D stenosis example in the paper. So this refers to this problem here. Okay, so um, the code is structured similar to the previous codes that we looked at, uh, but uh, I'm still going to go over it. So here we will, let's start from the uh, main code. So here's the main part where we input all the parameters. So, uh, uh, we uh, define whether we want to use batch, which in this case, since it's a 2D problem, we have many collocation points. We definitely want to use batches during training. Uh, we can define here the different lambda coefficients, which are the weights for weighting the boundary condition loss and data loss into the total loss. We define our directories, the mesh file, the the walls, the, the VTK files that contain the boundary nodes, uh, whether that's inlet or wall, we will not be using the inlet data, but we're gonna implement it here and we will comment it out. And then uh, we specify the field name in the VTK file that we want to read, define the batch size or learning rate. Um, and then uh, we set some parameters in the number of equations. We use some scaling. So we want to make sure whenever we solve uh, with uh, any neural network problem are inputs, any input to the neural network and any output to the neural network is normalized or between minus one and one. So that way we get much better performance during training. So you have to be careful because if you set up your code to make sure the inputs and outputs are normalized, when you want to probe the code, meaning that you've saved your output PT file and you want to read it and convert it to a format that you can visualize, which we'll talk in the next tutorial, you want to make sure your input is normalized and the output that you get is that you've got to keep in mind that that's also normalized. So you have to convert it back to physical variable by using your scales. And also, if you want to save it to a mesh, you need to read the mesh in physical domain, so the actual VTK file. So you read your actual VTK file, which has your collocation points, so your, the mesh that you want to solve P over. And then um, you will normalize your X, Y inputs as you're passing it to your saved neural network to get the outputs, and you assign it to the actual physical coordinate system. So you can, you know, um, uh, you know, visualize your data in physics in the physical domain, not in the scale domain. Okay, great. So we can also use scheduler here. So a scheduler, I highly recommend for complex problems. So the way it works is that you typically start by larger learning rates. So this is the starting learning rate, and every in this case twelve hundred epochs. What this scheduler, which you'll see in a moment, does is that multiplies the learning rate by 0 0.1. So it basically reduces the learning rate or just multiplies the learning rate with whatever coefficient we specify here. And that's desirable. At the beginning, we take larger steps. As we get closer and closer to the solution, we reduce our learning rate so we can converge more efficiently. Okay, so here I'm reading the mesh using VTK. So I read all my XY mesh. This is using VTK readers. I convert it to XY that I want to use. And then um, I also uh, read my boundary conditions. So there's the inlet that I read, which I will not use in this example, and also read the file for the walls. So these are just boundary with files that contain the nodes on the boundaries, in this case, the wall, and I'll get the X, Y coordinate systems of the wall, which I need for assigning my nose to boundary condition. And I can assign the inlet boundary condition if I wanted to solve a, a forward problem, but I'm not going to do that in this specific example. Okay, so then uh, we uh, define our boundary conditions. So uh, we want to assign zero, okay? So for all the points on the wall, so n points W are the number of points at the wall, which we can uh, get from VTK here. So VTK tells us the data to read how many points it has. And I set those as my final boundary points, which I call X, B, and Y, B, and the corresponding values, in this case, zero, which are called U, B, and B. And I won't use the inlet data. Okay, 
Um, then I, in this case, I have some sparse data measurements. So these are the data measurement points, the X, Y, Z position. So the Z is all zero because this is just a 2D problem. So what I do is that I read my VTK file that contains the velocity data from CFT simulations, and I probe it at these points using VTK probe filters. So I probe the data like this, and I'll talk more about VTK in the VTK tutorial series. So I probe the data, I get my U and V components of velocity and I scale them, okay? Because everything I have is scaled here. Okay, so remember the inputs to my neural networks are X and Y and my outputs are U, V, P. I wanna make sure they're all not larger than one. They're absolute values. Okay, great. So I, then I pass all this information into my main function. Before doing that, I need to make sure that I reshape the arrays in appropriate format to get a 2D array that PyTorch can work with. Okay, let's look at the main main uh, the, the actual function that runs this. So we read all the inputs that we all the arrays that we define, we convert them to torch tensor. If we're running on CUDA, we want to make sure that we convert it to an appropriate and uh, float type. Otherwise, we might not get the, the speed up that we desire on CUDA. It's going to be running on GPU. Um, then uh, what we do is that we define our switch activation functions, and then we go to the main neural network. So for each variable, I have a separate neural network, one for U, V, my X and Y components of velocity, and one neural network for pressure. So each of these neural networks, the input layer starts from input N, which should be set to two. So that's my input, which is X and Y, and I pass it through a series of layers and my hidden HN defines the number of neurons for that layer. So, and then fin the final layer maps back HN to one because my output is just a single you know, parameter, in this case, U, okay? So that's my neural network, fully connected neural network for U. Then I do the same thing for V and P, okay? Then I initialize them. I, I, I randomly initialize their weights so that that's, desirable, so it makes the training a little bit faster. Uh, I define my optimizers for UVP. Okay, so these are the different uh, optimizers that I have. And then um, I go, this criterion function is where I define my PDEs. So I uh, essentially, the inputs are X and Y. Okay, that I want to differentiate with respect to. Then I pass this X and Y to my neural networks, the three neural networks that I want to solve for UVP and like this. And I can take gradients of any of these with respect to X and Y. So to build first derivatives, and if I take another X derivative of the first derivative, I get the second derivative of U with respect to X. So I can do all of those and I have some scaling because I'm using solving the problem in non-dimensional form. So I need to write my number Stokes equations in non-dimensional fashion. So this is here's how I do that. So I have my X, Y directions of momentum and I have my continuity equation. And then my loss function, so my total loss function, are these three components added together. And you can see that I'm using mean squared error loss and each of these residuals, I want them to be equal to zero. So that's why I use, I want to, the loss is basically this residual being equal to this value in a mean squared error sense. And this value is, is an array of just zeros as the same size as the loss, okay? And I have the X, Y continuity added here. So if you like to, for example, place more weight for continuity because you know usually continuity is harder to satisfy. You can add a coefficient higher than one here, kind of like a, another lambda parameter. Here's our boundary condition, which we read the boundary condition points, their corresponding values. So here you can see I've commented out the inlet. So that's what makes this problem an inverse problem because I'm not imposing inlet. Instead, I'm going to have data loss. And I'm only imposing the loss on the no slip boundary condition, which is this one. The next function is lost data, which reads the data points, the sparse measurement points I define, and the corresponding values, which are the values I probed using V2K from my CFD simulation. And the lost data here is that I want the U component of my network. So here I'm passing the data points to the network that I want to find, getting an output, and making sure that output is equal to what I desire it to be equal to, in this case, the data. So same but for U. Same thing for V. So the out one V is the output that I pass my data points as input and I get out one V 
my y component of velocity, which my network predicts. And I want that to be equal to, at these points, to the data that I have, which is the data that I've probed. Uh, probed. Okay, if you already have your, if you already trained this somehow, either in a multi-fidelity sense or you've, you know, your simulation somehow stopped, you want to run it again, you can use this flag here to load your PT files and continue from where you left off, as opposed to just starting from scratch, okay? And here is how you define a scheduler, which is, you know, having a variable learning rate. So your learning rate is not necessarily constant, but it gets it changes. Usually it gets reduced as you get closer to the solution. Okay, so here we're using batching. So we're gonna be at this part and we loop over all the epochs. We load our data from you know, our batch and we initialize the networks. We pass it to the pass X and Y from the batch into the criterion to get last equation. We, we don't do batching for boundary condition and data. We pass the entire data to boundary condition and data because they're usually not very large. So we get the boundary condition loss, the data loss, and then this is my total loss that I want to minimize, the residual of my equation, my boundary condition weighted by lambda VC, and my data uh, criterion weighted by lambda data. And I do backpropagation and I add an optimization step. Okay, and I can keep track of each component of the loss. Too, because here I'm batching, so I can average them uh, to print the, the final average uh, loss over the entire batch, which is what I'm doing here. So I print this the loss information. Okay, and then once you're done, you can save your file. Uh, so, uh, uh, and if you like, you can plot it, but normally I prefer to take my PT file. So here's how where I'm saving my network. I take my PT file and then uh, convert it to VT chains. So usually in a separate file, you can write a script to convert your PT files to VTK format so you can visualize in Paraview. And I'll talk about that in the next tutorial. Uh, so that uh, sums up uh, this part.